What up, Cucks? It's your boy, The Hater, and it's Monday night, which means it's time for our Raw review. I'm going to try to make this a regular thing because if I'm going to do a video a day, I don't think there's a choice. I gotta review all the shows, basically, right? What else can I do with my time up in this piece? So let's get started with Raw, the Raw after um, King and Queen of the Ring, right? So we get started. First up on the card is Gunther. Gunther comes out with Ludwig Kaiser and bores everyone to death. He pretty much says all the Gunther things, which pretty much entails, oh, the ring is sacred, I'm going to elevate everything. He hasn't elevated anything thus far. You know what I mean? Gunther's one of those guys that like you want to like because you know he's going to be pushed down our throats, it looks like, for a while now, but there's nothing to like about this asshole. So, nevertheless, he comes out, the fans don't give a flying fuck, obviously, he's not really over, right? He's only over with the internet crowd. Like, the, the rest of the crowd doesn't give a shit about Gunther, right? Casual fans don't care about Gunther, motherfucks. So, as a result, the casual fans are chanting, we want Randy, right? That's just how it goes down. Randy Orton, you know, for, for better or for worse, he's a bigger star than Gunther. But I got something to say about Orton later on, motherfucks, in another video. So, as a result of winning the Royal Rumble, I mean, the King of the Ring, Gunther gets a title shot. Not against the real champion. He has to settle for the Raw champion. The bullshit champion. Gunther correctly says that this title has zero prestige. And that he has to elevate it. That second part is not very true. Because Gunther cannot elevate it. Because he's a mid-card nobody. But he's right. In that the title has zero prestige. Out comes Judgment Day. Right? Basically David Priest says a bunch of bullshit. And his whole thing is like. Look bro I earned it by winning the money in the bank. That's just how... How the, the, the money in the bank operates, right? It's not his fault that that's how the money in the bank works. So, you know, that's his counter-argument. It's not a very good counter-argument, right? Because Gunther's basically saying, you're a bullshit champion. He's like, oh, but I earned the right to be a bullshit champion. Okay, fantastic. Doesn't change the fact you're a bullshit champion. Drew McIntyre comes out. I don't know how they're going to get get around this, to be honest. Like, Drew McIntyre is going to have to beat uh, Damien Priest. There's just no way around it. You know what I mean? Like... Because he's going to be wrestling him in Scotland. It's like, really? Like, you're going to put, you know, Damien Priest over Drew McIntyre in Scotland? It doesn't seem likely, right? Because, you know, Damien Priest is a jobber. So it's like, if he loses to Drew McIntyre clean for the title, like, no love lost. Like, who cares, right? It's Damien Priest. It's not like John Cena. It's not like a real champion or anything like that. Even though I, I every fiber in my body wants to like Damien Priest, I feel like he's one of these guys that if they just told him, like, do whatever the fuck you want, he'd be much more interesting than he is now with the eye shatter and all these other things. But I digress. Nevertheless, uh, this is the title picture now. Uh, what's his face comes out? Braun Strowman comes out because he's like a big deal now again because he's back. I guess he's not teaming with Ricochet anymore. So he comes out and he's going to have a match with none other than J.D. McDonough, who every week I'm just surprised that he has a job. You know what I mean? It's just, it's fascinating to me that they correctly uh and you know successfully i should say put jd mcdonough in judgment day it's just fascinating isn't it it's like you just put him in there and like he doesn't really fit but like he also does because the group has no actual theme they have no actual gimmick it's just a group of wrestlers right like judgment day is not like they don't do anything that merits the name judgment day right when edge was there it kind of made sense because you know they would like judge people edge had a little balancing scale and he was this devilish guy right but now it's just literally a group of five, six wrestlers. They have nothing that connects them, right? But they're just there. So it is what it is. Judgment Day is kind of boring. But, you know, somehow JD McDonough has made it in there. And that's where we find ourselves. So obviously, Braun Strowman beats JD McDonough. Now, this should be like a 25-second match. Like, not even. It should be like, here's how this match should go. JD McDonough tries to run and drop kick or jumping punch or jumping forearm um, Braun Strowman in the middle of the ring. Braun Strowman no sells it. JD bounces off of him. Off of him. Braun grabs him. Power slam. One, two, three. That's how this match should end because it's ridiculous, right? It's absurd. Like Braun Strowman is like a foot and a half bigger than this jobber, right? I, like I've always liked JD McDonough for what he was, but this is just silly. But instead, this match takes several commercial breaks. And inevitably, Braun Strowman wins. This leads to like essentially what, what, what can best be described as a post-match beatdown 
Carlito, who's like trying to get into Judgment Day, he's basically doing the same thing JD McDonough did like last year. He tries to get in there and try to do some shit. Uh, him and Finn, Braun Strowman like uh, fights it off, and be pretty much Braun Strowman starts chasing JD McDonough. Now this is something that should just be like a throwaway moment, but this will be relevant later on, right? Uh, then we have a small interview with Liv Morgan. Nobody gives a flying fuck, right? Um, backstage, Damien Priest is upset at the rest of Judgment Day. Basically, he's like, yo, am I going to have to fix all your guys' mistakes, right? Because he's kind of like their de facto leader. And he's like, do I have to just fix everything, every mistake you guys make? Because that's not, that's not looking good, right? Um, that's basically what happens. Then we've got uh, Ricochet versus Ilya Dragunov. This was interesting because it's like, Ricochet is clearly like I'm not. I'm not gonna say he's getting a push, but you know he's he's in he's in one of the better runs of his career, let's just say, and he's fighting a debuting Ilya Dragunov. So I'm like, oh, I don't know, I don't know who's gonna win, right? Like, um, I would have guessed Ricochet, but none of the above. Something better happens. Braun Breaker comes and destroys Ricochet. Great. Uh, after the match, Adam Pierce is like, why are you doing this? And it's like. Why the fuck wouldn't he? You know what I'm saying? Like, Adam Pearce doesn't have any say in what Braun Breaker does. He signed for the other team. He signed for SmackDown, and then they just drafted him. So it's like, why would Braun, Braun Breaker give a fuck about answering to, to Adam Pearce? That's the problem with having two shows, right? If you're someone like Braun Breaker, and the, the storyline, if you will, I wouldn't call it a storyline, but like the, the booking is that both SmackDown and Raw want Braun Breaker. If that's the case, then why would he listen to anybody? He can just... He can beat up Adam Pearce and be like, I'm going to go to SmackDown. What are you going to do, fire me? SmackDown will sign me, right? So it's a little bit complicated, but that's what happens, right? Uh, Adam Pearce is obviously pissed. And now Braun Breaker is going to end up with Kiana James. Uh, she has like a businesswoman gimmick, so maybe she's going to be his manager. I actually think this is kind of brilliant. Um, I don't think Braun Breaker needs it because he's actually pretty good on the mic for, for what he is. But this is a good way to elevate both, right? Uh, that's a lost art. Nowadays, it's like... They'll, everyone will be like, well, put someone with Paul Heyman, which in this case, I actually would agree. But uh, the idea is that Paul Heyman is already established so he can possibly elevate someone else, right? But it's like, why don't two of us elevate each other? That's another viable strategy. So, you know, I like the way this was going. Then we got the, the Authors of Pain versus the Creed Brothers. Now, this is a rare moment where I actually like both teams. I like the Authors of Pain. I always have because they remind me of a mix of like the Acolytes and um, obviously the Legion of Doom, right? Um, or the Road Warriors. So that's what happens. They go and they beat up the Creed Brothers, who I also like a lot. But they hit their finisher, which is now called What A Rush. It's basically the, the DWI that Beer Money used to do. But what can you do? That's what it is, right? Uh, they beat, the, in my opinion, the better tag team of the Creed Brothers. These are probably my two favorite tag teams in wrestling right now. Um, so I don't know how I feel about the fact that uh, they're both jobbers. <laughs> but what are you going to do, right? Then uh, Sheamus is walking around backstage and Braun Strowman is looking for J.D. McDonough. So once again, this rears its ugly head. Then we have a situation with, uh, what's his face? Sheamus talking shit about Ludwig Kaiser. This is like really depressing to see Sheamus like essentially entering a feud with Ludwig Kaiser. It's just, it's absurd. Like Ludwig Kaiser should be jobbing to like fucking Tozawa but he's out there wrestling Sheamus, or he's, he's going to be in a feud with Sheamus. Then we have our mandatory Becky Lynch, Lyra Valkyria uh, fucking segment. They keep trying to shove Lyra Valkyria down her throats like nobody wants to see her. She's as boring as they get. She was boring in NXT because I didn't know who, who she was or what her name was. But there you have it. Lyra Valkyria versus uh, Kyrie Sane. Lyra Valkyria uh, wins. Um, Kyrie Sane is obviously... In that, in like the I mean, the whole damage control is they're obviously on a on like a downturn, right? Like they're going backwards now. So there you have it. Nobody gives a flying fuck. Next up, we have Rey Mysterio versus Carlito. Rey Mysterio overcomes the odds as usual and hits the six one nine and wins the match as he should, motherfucks. Um, then of course after the match, Rey Mysterio gets attacked um, and the, the 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 takeaway here is that Damian Priest comes and just beats up everybody, right? Like. The whole point is that Damien Priest is the only member of Judgment Day that's like not a complete retard. That's like the booking of Judgment Day now. It's like Finn Balor has essentially kind of been absorbed 
by J.D. McDonough as like these two incompetents. Uh, Dominic Mysterio is the biggest incompetent of them all because uh, he screwed the women's title match um, at the pay-per-view. And as we're going to see soon, he's going to have another moment here. Then we got big Bronson Reed versus Otis Dozovich. Um, that's what it says here to refresh my memory, but, you know, big Otis, right? Uh, Bronson Reed wins, of course. Otis is like a comedy jobber. He deserves better, but that's what he is. Bronson Reed wins, and this leads to Chad Gable being angry at Otis. And this is just basically a, a segment to really put over uh, Chad Gable, really, right? Uh, Sami Zayn comes out and basically, like, saves the day. But the, 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 key, the key takeaway here, the, the person that needs to be made from this is Chad Gable. And I think that's what's going to happen. Hopefully he gets his Intercontinental title shot and win as a result, right? Um, basically, they're just doing a slow burn of Otis eventually learning to stand up for himself, which is a very Otis storyline. It's a very, you know what I mean? It's a very Otis-y uh, storyline. Then we finally have the main event after three boring hours. We have the main event of Becky Lynch versus Liv Morgan. I actually like, I can't believe I'm going to say this, I like the way that this match ended conceptually, right? Basically, Dominic Mysterio is retarded, so he cost Becky Lynch, uh, sorry, yeah, he, yeah, yeah, I guess he cost Becky Lynch the match again, right? He's trying to help her out, which is, like, absurd, because I don't know why he's doing this. Like, Becky Lynch is supposed to be the superior of her and Liv Morgan, right? The whole point is that, like, you know, that Dominic Mysterio is helping... Uh, Becky Lynch, but Becky Lynch is the one that's expected to win, right? It would be like if Takamichi Noko came out to help The Rock beat, I don't know, Big Boss Man, right? It's like, yeah, you expect The Rock to win anyways. But, you know, all of this is going to make sense at some point. Obviously, it's clear where this is going. But basically, long story short, what happens here is as follows, right? Dominic Mysterio is trying to get Becky Lynch to crawl out of the cage, but uh, all of a sudden... That fucking like cartoon character, uh, J.D. McDonough, is being chased by that other idiot, by fucking the wily e. coyote of WWE, Braun Strowman, who's like this fucking retarded bull who just runs around chasing people. So he's chasing them around. This leads to a confusion. Dominic smacks the door by accident, slams it into Becky Lynch's dumb head, and Liv Morgan gets out. Then Liv Morgan and Dominic have like a moment, if you will, right? Like. They have like a, you know, like, I mean, I wouldn't call it like a kiss, right? Um, but, you know, she kind of like goes after him, giving him like a, what should be considered a kiss. But it's not really like, you know, like they're not together together, right? Um, obviously, this is leading up to the eventual return of Rhea Ripley. And Dominic is obviously going to side with Rhea Ripley, right? He, he might side with uh, Liv Morgan like short term. But this is going to be like him and Rhea Ripley are obviously... Eddie Guerrero in China 2.0. That's the whole point, right? Except unlike Eddie Guerrero being like, you know, like a mid-card champion type, um, ch you know, like in this case, Rhea Ripley is like the star, right? Um, and that, and it's going to turn into something, something else down the line. But at this point, we're still in the mommy phase. And I think even if like Judgment Day breaks up while Rhea, Lip Rhea Ripley's gone, right? You kind of already know where everyone's going to fall. Dominic might fall with Liv, uh, JD and Finn can be a tag team of jobbers and Damien Priest can go, you know, have a few years more in his career before he gets released and ends up on AEW uh, because this guy's never going to be like a big star. So, I mean, he has the potential to in some ways, but it's never going to happen, right? So, and then ev eventually when Rhea Ripley comes back, she might reform the Judgment Day. Maybe that's what happens. She reforms the Judgment Day and the entire point is like the, the last person left is Dominic and he refuses to join and then eventually he betrays Liv Morgan and joins the Judgment Day and goes back to where he belongs with Mommy, right? So, overall, this was, I mean, I hate to say it, but this is one of the better Raws, right? Like, um, I enjoyed, um, like, the, the, the main event, it was a women's match, but it felt natural, right? Um, it felt natural because it was the only match that had any kind of connection to the PLE, right? To the pay-per-view. Everything else that happened was completely unrelated. You know what I mean? Like, you have, like, J.D. McDonough versus Braun Strowman. These guys are not good enough to be on the PLE. You have AOP and Creed Brothers. They're not good enough to be on the on the PLE, right? So, you know, it felt like, like a logical main event because it was the only match that had any kind of connection to the PLE. 
and there's a storyline behind it, right? And I'm a sucker for storylines. I want to see people like Dominic Mysterio be more involved in the storylines. That's where he shines, right? It's really interesting, actually. Because Rey Mysterio, obviously, his shining moments were all in the ring, right? But Dominic is like the opposite. He might get good in the ring, but it doesn't matter. He's good at telling stories. That's what matters to me, motherfucks. So I give this Raw, I'm going to give it a rare 7.5 um, out of 10. Maybe even an 8. Now, I know that's being very generous. But this was my my favorite Raw in a long time. I actually enjoyed it. Now, um, I enjoyed it primarily for one reason, one reason only. And that is the booking of the Dominic Mysterio segment. Um, and everything else that goes around that, right? Um, including, I hate to fucking say this, I can't believe I'm saying it. But including the Braun Strowman, um, you know, intervention in this in this like situation, right? Um, it's very cartoony, but it's a step in the right direction, right? You want to see the thing that happens at the beginning of the event have some bearing at the end of the event. So just that right there, I think, is like worthy of of commending, right? That's like one of my favorite things about wrestling in the past. It was like someone would come out in the beginning and then that person would come out again and again and again and you would know what's going on either that episode or that week or that month, right? The person would have a, an ongoing storyline. So like, now it'd be silly, for example, if Braun Strowman is still chasing JD McDonough next Monday, right? But only if he's like literally chasing him. If he's trying to find him, he's like, where's JD, right? That'd be interesting. Well, let's see where that goes. But... You know, there you have it. I got nothing more to say about that shit. Um, good Raw. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to next week's Raw. I actually want to know what's going to happen with Dominique and Liv Morgan. So, you know, just for that alone, it gets some, some props. Cucks.